I guess what I want to just real touch uh, touch base on quickly here, uh, Bob talked about three of us um, uh, presenting this uh, information here today. Um, I got about five slides. I'll talk briefly, kind of talk about some of the mega trends and kind of how these mega trends are impacting our, all of our you know, channel here, all of our industry, right down to end users and operators. Ani's going to talk, do a little deep dive on DOE regulations and how it's impacting the refrigeration equipment that, uh, that we all work with here day in and day out. Um, namely uh, walk-ins, reach-ins, and ice machines. And then Jeff Johnson is going to uh, uh, end the, the presentation here with just talking through the total cost of ownership. So when you're kind of going through equipment redesigns, you know, what kinds of things, what kind of considerations do you make uh, when you're looking at equipment redesigns and looking at the product life cycles of, those equip of that equipment. So just kind of real briefly here, kind of get us going. Uh, we talk about mega trends. Uh, top two charts, you know, on the on the vertical piece here, regulations we've talked about. You know, these are <laughs> these aren't your uh, your dad's regulations. Right? These are step change functions, right? So when we look at all these application segments, significant increases in minimum efficiency standards. This isn't an option. This is stuff that you have to contend with to continue to do in business. So pretty significant topic for all of us. Uh, right hand side is the refrigerants. Rajan showed a variation of this slide here this morning if you were in that session uh, with the F gases and our refrigerants. You know, one, one set of regulations from the Department of Energy is certainly enough, but when you combine that with the refrigerants piece of this, uh, it becomes quite a tsunami for all of us, right? So how do we navigate through that? Well, what do we work on first? How do, we, how do we comply at the end of the day by the dates required? You know, historically, we talked about, uh, you know, we look at end users and operators, they focus on operational efficiencies was a lot of their story, right? Trying to decrease costs, uh, trying to look at their operations, try to make some profit. You know, that's kind of still important, but what's becoming more important is the growth of the C store operations. And they're looking at this whole fresh food concept, you know, for their growth trajectory. So when you look at this space now, it's kind of, kind of becoming a confusing space. You have these large retailers who are kind of repurposing themselves in these small format type of operations, uh, all kind of aimed at consumers and uh, grab and go fresh food kinds of items here. And then you have these C stores who are kind of morphing themselves into quick serve restaurants essentially. So it's kind of all competing in this space here. Uh, reasons why they're doing that is for their own growth and their own profitability. And um, there's no secret about that with them. Um, but when you look at all these dynamics here happening to the equipment, you know, what are, we, what are we doing as an industry to address this? Not only from the regulations and minimum efficiency equipment side of things, but also helping the end user with the growth. So again, it's not just energy, you know, it's not just operational cost. Lots of considerations to make here when we're looking at equipment redesigns. Uh, and that's, what, that's kind of what it is, it's equipment redesign. This is not component tweaks anymore, you know. Years past, we've been able to kind of work on components, tweaking components, but today it's more system, system uh, redesign considerations. It doesn't mean you have to you know, redesign everything you're doing today, but there's gonna be a significant part of OEM's production that's gonna have to be changed, fundamentally changed and redesigned. What does that mean to everybody? It's gonna mean different things to everybody. And that's where Emerson, you know, again, we're trying to engage the industry, we're trying to understand what's your business model, you know, how you wanna compete kind of going forward. One solution, one, you know, it's not no silver bullet. One solution is not going to apply to one OEM and end user combination versus another. They're going to be different. So it really requires a lot of collaboration, a lot of discussion, and a lot of planning. And that's what we're trying to drive here. Uh, I talked about the regulation piece, the uh, refrigerant piece, the efficiency piece. Obviously, the reliability, serviceability, and safety items aren't going away. You know, we still have to be transparent with those to the end users. We talked about reduced technician forces. Uh, reduced experience to technician forces, all those kinds of issues here. Um, Talked to uh, Roy here from Wendy's. He's explaining to me here this afternoon that, you know, when he's looking at, it's not just one single operation you're trying to deal with. It's 6,000, you know, franchise stores, if you will. And they're all different. They all operate different. They're all applied different. They got different service people, and they got different standards in some, in some cases. So that creates quite a bit of unknown. You know, when you're looking at redesigning equipment, you've got to make sure those things are addressed. Total cost of ownership. Um, again, Jeff's been gracious enough to uh, spend some time with us, show us a few of his thoughts with respect to their model and how 
uh, heat craft looks at total cost of ownership and the considerations they make. So they'll be talking a little bit about that later in the presentation. Before I move on, any, any questions on any of that content? Not going to spend a lot of time on this slide. Uh, Rajan talked through it here a little bit this morning. You know, the point that I wanted to make on this here is obviously the dates and the timing. You know, we were originally thinking first, second quarter calendar year 15, the EPA would have some sort of response here in terms of a final rule. Now it's kind of looking like uh, end of summer, um, beginning end of summer type of, uh, type of thing. So, you know, there's a lot for they have to consider. Obviously by law, they have to address the commentary that they've received and uh, obviously that takes time. So the whole 2016 thing, um, you know, without going out on the limb too much, I don't, I don't think anybody in this room is really thinking that 2016 is a reality, you know, for the delisting of, of uh, the refrigerants. But, you know, nonetheless, it, it really doesn't divorce us from the need of kind of getting going, getting the testing going. Let's learn some things. Let's understand where you're not. Let's understand where you are. And that's kind of what we're imploring, um, you know, the channel partners to do. 404A, we're probably all in agreement that's probably going to get delisted. After 404A, it's going to be anybody's, you know, it's going to be anybody's debate. And there's all kinds of debate out there. Um, you know, the realities are because one refrigerant, one application, and one industry is, is delisted does not mean it's going to be in the other. So there's going to be a lot of combinations and permutations here. We'll only know at the end of the summer when the final rule issues, or when it does. Another chart here, uh, the point I want to make on this chart, this is a, a chart of the DOE regulations by application. And, you know, the point I want to make here is this column right here called effective or compliance. This is by law. Every one of these regulations now within the food service space U.S. commercial is in final rule form. So these, this is all law now. And you can debate about uh, the government and, and uh, legal ramifications and all the things that the industry is working with the government on here. But uh, again, uh, this reach in and the display cases, March 2017, we're looking at two years now, two years to be in producing equipment on our back doors that have to be compliant. So, you know, again, we just kind of implore our partners here to kind of continue to, to dialogue, work with your channel partners and you know start laying out these game plans and understanding what we all need to do about two and a half years of walk-in is going to kick in that's not a lot of time and a little less than three years now the ice final rule just came out so we're looking at the first of the year 2018 so um lots lots to happen there don't know where the refrigerants are going to drop um, we're probably all hopefully you know um, hopeful that they'll be after the doe regulations but there's no guarantee that that will happen so it's all the more reason for us to continue to engage, continue to lay out our plans, continue to roadmap how we want to address this and comply, and ultimately get with our end users and making those folks happy. Last slide I have, um, I wasn't going to go through a real complete detail, line by line analysis here. What I did want to show is that everybody in this room is going to be impacted because of the magnitude of the regulations we're talking about, both in refrigerants and efficiency coupled with the dynamics in the market and the whole fresh food concept and the profitabilities of these end users going forward. Well, that, those things aren't going to go away. These are system related changes we're talking about. These are component tweaks. So everybody's going to be responsible all the way down to end users and operators with respect to footprint, space management. I'll pick out a few here, right? Um, system architectures, service training, Equipment operation, user interface differences. We talked about smarter equipment. What's that going to mean? Is there electronics involved? Is there more interfacing involved with our operators and end users? What kind of training, what kind of you know, understanding are they going to need here to run their businesses? Maintenance training, we talked about that. Don't want to belabor that point. But you know, obviously, redesigning equipment is going to, new, going to need new maintenance protocols here. So a lot of things have to happen when this equipment starts getting shipped out the door two to three years from now. So again, I just you know, want to kind of implore all of us to kind of continue the engagement, uh, continue the proactivity. To Rosin's earlier point this morning, start the testing. Start understanding where you are. Start understanding where you're not. And you know, let's build a roadmap to kind of get us into the future here. 
I just kind of want to understand as far as the, the audience that is sitting in this room, raise your hand if you're an equipment manufacturer. Okay, contractors, wholesalers. Okay, other design consultants, manufacturing reps, gotcha. So overwhelmingly we're looking at equipment manufacturers in this room. Um, rightfully so, because you know, part of this Department of Energy, we got this two-headed monster coming at us with the Environmental Protection Agency that's beginning in January of 2016. And then you have these regulations that are impacting in 2017. And you, you got to wonder, even if you're not in this industry, how, how exactly can the EPA come out with a refrigerant delisting earlier than the regulations for energy efficiencies when those standards were developed on incumbent refrigerants? So I think picking back off of what Alan was stating as far as, you know, 2016 January for an EPA delisting, that's a bargaining chip by the Environmental Protection Agency. They're looking at a longer window, but they're going to bid low. Um, all indications are hopefully pointing towards that when we expect to see this ruling coming out in summer. But um, specifically for the three application segments that I'm going to talk about, you can kind of see up here in this commercial refrigeration equipment that we coin as reach in, but that's not the only type of equipment that we're talking about. It's basically self-contained systems as well as some of those systems that are remote. Then you have walk-in coolers and freezers. And then finally you have the automatic commercial ice makers. So we start off with the commercial refrigeration equipment, the self-contained systems, and that's going to impact in March of 2017. That is measured as a system level in terms of kilowatt hours per 24 hour day. And condensing unit suppliers and, and the likes were a component in that total system. And it is basically, the, there is a variable as, in this technical support document that the Department of Energy releases. One is the final rule, the other is this massive 900 plus page technical support document. And they have equations for each class of equipment. And, it's, and the variable for, that, for each class is basically it's either total display area, if it's an open display case, or it's by volume, the actual cubic feet. And then you look on the walk-in cooler piece, that is measured into three components. And there's a slide here that will kind of break that up and we'll go into more detail. But the, uh, sp specifically for the refrigeration systems, it's what we call the AWEF, the Annualized Walk-In Energy Factor. Then you also have the doors as well, which is here, which is uh, the MEC, the maximum energy consumption. And then you also have the R value for the actual panels, the case itself. So these are three separate items as far as walk-in coolers and freezers need to meet in order to be successful to me meeting the, uh, the DOE standards. And finally, you have the commercial uh, ice makers. This is the same thing as the self-contained system the, the commercial refrigeration equipment, except now it's measured in kilowatt hours per 100 pounds of ice. And the variable there is the harvest rate in pounds per 24 hours because you have different systems of ice machines. One that's uh, 200 pounds, 500 pounds, all the way up to 1,000 pounds. It's also measured in two different classes of equipment that um, is, it's, it's either going to be continuous machines where you don't uh, uh, actually have a harvest cycle so it's basically a motor up top that is just churning the ice. So it's the type of ice that is produced. Then you have batch machines. And this is the, these are the machines you'll see on your hotel floors. And then you'll hear the chunklets coming down. So it's just different shapes of ice. And it's measured into either batch machines or continuous machines. So um, let's get into on the self-contained uh, reach-in systems. So here are the equipment classes that the way they stack it up. They first say, is it a commercial refrigerator or freezer? Then they move out. Do they say with or without doors? And then, by the way, what, what kind of doors are there? Are they solid or transparent? And then you kind of go into whether they're self-contained or remote. And then finally, understand what kind of an orientation. Is it vertical, horizontal, semi-vertical? And then finally, what is the temperature range? Is it a freezer or a medium temp cooler? Once you understand, and then here are some pictures of all the equipment that uh, overwhelming equipment people that are here, uh, if you're in this um, application segment, that you'll recognize. But there are exceptions to this, and I wanted to point out here. There are no energy conservation standards and test procedures 
for salad bars, buffet tables, uh, prep tables, and the likes. There are different kinds of systems. There's not energy up top, but there's energy at the bottom. So they kind of fall outside of the regulations. However, if there is a reach in under then, there is a specific application process to get a waiver so that you can take advantage of that. I will also say this, that for all three of these application segments, for commercial ice makers, walk-in coolers, freezers, commercial refrigerated equipment, the Department of Energy is creating a database, a database where all these pieces of equipment needs to be published with, in terms of whatever the measure is, kilowatt hours per day, kilowatt hours per 100 pounds of ice, all that information has to be published on this DOE database. I believe for the self-contained on uh, re commercial refrigerators and freezers, I think that deadline was something like December 31st, but since then there's been a six month grace period to get all those pieces of equipment published. There's been glitches all over the place with that database and as of last night I checked, there's about 1,200 pieces of equipment that have been published. Um, are you guys aware of that and is there any commentary on that? Moving along, <clears throat> so, so I kind of start off with the scope and uh, an understanding of what the equipment is and then this, the follow-up slide is basically some design options of how we're thinking about it and, and, and talking to you guys on what are those levers that we can pull. So certainly as a component supplier, you have condensing units, you have compressors. So what are some of those engineering options and levers that we can pull? This graph over here measures in terms of efficiency and percent energy savings, and then on the, the x-axis, about a relative, y-axis, about a relative cost. And then these curves are kind of measuring what those pieces of uh, improvements are and what the, the bang for the buck is, the trade-offs. So you can kind of look over here on this purple line, which is the components, which is better insulation for the actual uh, refrigerator or freezer. Then you have BPM motors. We've, we have more efficient motors, perhaps, on the compressor. That picks up some efficiency. All the way up to variable speed compressors. So you get the biggest bang in terms of efficiency, but at the same time, your costs are increasing. The Department of Energy makes no bones about the fact that this is the case. Right? I think we are all kind of embracing it, finally understanding it. But it, it's definitely looking like you know, our pieces of equipment, the systems, are going to increase in costs. Um, it's now calculating and measuring, well, what is the best and most efficient way we can do that in terms of the dollar spent and the energy received from doing so. Um, we also have bigger condenser coils. I'll kind of talk through this. So, you know, normally we, and, and this has been impacting our air conditioning market for over 25, 30 years, right? Since the late 80s, these regulations have hit which is why our condensing unit on our outside of our home went from being this tall to now this tall. They oversized the condenser coil. That may not be the case, especially for self-contained refrigeration systems when we just talked about this morning about floor space and high density kitchens and the likes. And now you're gonna ask a operator, an end user, to purchase a piece of equipment that's now taller, giving them less space to store their sellable goods. So, it's, but that's a trade-off. It now depends on what kind of a design of a cabinet that needs to be if, if we want to take advantage of a bigger condenser coil. And those are decisions that need to be made. But directionally, that is an option. Um, a couple more, we're talking about LED lighting on the systems. I've, I've heard that that is also another trending uh, lever that can be pulled. Uh, it's obviously higher in first cost, but that also pulls less energy. So we got a LED lighting, we're talking about insulation, possibly bigger condenser coils. Um, also looking at the actual compressor itself, compression technology, which is, do we have enough space to go from a reciprocating compressor, reciprocating hermetic compressor to perhaps a scroll or a higher efficiency compressor? Something to think about. On the walk-in coolers and freezers, we did a Making Sense webinar series uh, and where we talked about this and went to great detail about how this is measured. This is a little bit more complicated than the self-contained refrigeration systems because, again, it's just kilowatt hours per day. You can measure that. 
for the walk-in coolers and freezers, what you now have to first understand is, well, what are the two avenues that the Department of Energy have provided rulings for? So they start with our dedicated condensing systems that we are well aware. It's either outdoor or indoor. And then you have your multiplex systems as well. They stack it up by basically going, is it a medium temp, low temp, indoor or outdoor? And then based on the size and the capacity of the system, less than or greater than 9,000 BTU per hour. And then they also specifically, they come up with equations for this on the type of compression technology, recip, semi-hermetics, or scroll. So let me walk you through. So box number one are all the pieces of equipment classes that I showed in the previous chart, and they have equations assigned to them, A, W, E, F. Box number three are the Department of Energy's design options that they have invested and done the market research on and done their own testing and validation with the help of their design consultant, Navigant, who is their consulting arm for the Department of Energy. They have taken all those design options and started ranking them. So they do this box over here where they do a cost efficiency data for whatever class of equipment, and they do it for every single one of them in this 915-page technical support document. I extracted one of those. So for this example, it's a dedicated condensing, low temp, outdoor scroll condensing unit, about 54,000 BTU per hour. And so what they've done is, well, they, there's an equation for this particular piece of equipment here. To, in order to hit that piece of equipment, it turns out they have to go from an efficiency level of L0 all the way down to L10 which in this particular example, they meet AWEF at a variable speed compressor. And by and large, for that, the cost impact is $2,800. They have basically understood a market average selling price of the piece of equipment and, and the cost for that. And for this example, it's about a 41% cost increase. So the second chart for the walk-ins is just directionally, the first thing that you kind of want to look at is the compressor, right? That's your biggest uh, energy load. So directionally, we kind of have Emerson has kind of tried to understand, well, based on compression technology that's out there, what can we do to try to improve that to, make, to hit these AWF values? The orange box is medium temp. The blue box is low temp. And then now you can kind of see the medium temp applications up here with, with compression and then the low temp side. So you have reciprocating compressors with hot gas defrost and additional coil as using our baseline. So from there, directionally, we, again, we are, we are now analyzing that and actually validating the testing results to back this chart up. So we start on the low temp side. And then you have scroll here with floating head pressures. Let me um, state that for the Department of Energy, their design options mandates floating head pressures for every application, for every class of equipment. It's almost like floating head pressures is a necessity now going forward. What does that mean? It's basically for now what we've always seen is our head pressures being fixed at 100 degrees. But that's all well, but when you have low ambient conditions, you don't have to have that high of a TD when it comes to the condensing. So you want to float the head pressure from 100, and then for scrolls, it'll go down to 50 degrees. On our recips, it's about 70, 75. So you want to take advantage of reducing your TD as best as you can by floating the head pressures. In doing so, you're not running the pump as long to get it up to 100 degrees when your ambient condition is like 30 degrees or whatever. So in low condensing operations, this is technology that exists today that can be taken advantage of in order to get there. It's just, um, right now, we've, you know, it's, just a, um, it's just an educational thing to consider. Um, there's a lot of people that decide not to do that. They go with the hot gas bypass and well, for, for reverse defrost, but they keep a headmaster to keep that pressure constant. But I think a key component of this is if they go to scroll with floating head pressures, and now as a result of floating your head pressures, you're going to need some way of controlling your superheat. So therefore, you use this electronic expansion valve that is, can measure that and basically account for that as needed. 
The next thing you can do is do with vapor injection. This is another free kind of energy, if you will. You can kind of get your extra capacity by doing that, so you're not running the compressor as long, and you get that, and you don't have, and you get, you, you're able to pick up some efficiency there. And finally, you have variable speed um, as your option. From all indications from Emerson, when we've done this analysis, and 50% of my time and in product marketing is on regulations and making sure that, you know, basically our engineering teams are able to understand what we're translating and then developing a roadmap for it. But just directionally speaking, we're, we're thinking about on the medium temp indoor and medium temp outdoor, we should be okay when it comes to scroll technology. Um, but we want to validate that. We want to understand with you guys and, and, and to make sure that our assumptions are valued. Our low temp outdoor is the challenge. The AWF values are extremely aggressive on the low temp outdoor. And that is why we have kind of <clears throat> laid this out to be like directionally, here's where we're headed. We still need to do more validation. We still need to talk with our, uh, our, our OEM partners and making sure we understand going forward. Yes? His question was, in our condensing unit packages, are we going to offer uh, with floating head pressure packages and all the components needed to do that? That is something we're evaluating on paper, and we got to have some kind of a plan, right? It's one thing to, to throw this up on a chart, but it's another thing to show you validated results and actual application results and say, here's why you need to do this, and here's how much you're going to get, and here's your solution to meet AWF. By the way, meeting regulations, that's just the cost to play the game. You have Energy Star that will kind of tear up your product, right? That's the whole point is to incentivize so you can slap that Energy Star sticker on it. So meeting AWF and meeting a commercial refrigerating kilowatt hours per day or kilowatt hours or 100 pounds of ice, that's just the cost to play the game especially now that you have to publish the information on a website, a DOE register, if you will. So that's just to play the game. Then you how you tier your products and how you decide what technologies have to drop off because they're not meeting and having to transition is a whole separate conversation that's very easy, right? It's just a piece of cake. So finally, um, I talked about commercial ice makers. Uh, batch machines and continuous machines, these regulations um, are impacting uh, as well. This is the one, again, uh, on the self-contained reach-in side, uh, the commercial refrigeration, that is March of 2017. For walk-in coolers and freezers, that's June of 2018. This rule came uh, basically proposed final in December, this past December, so it's going to take effect January of 2018. Of the commercial refrigerating, refrigeration equipment, the walk-in coolers and commercial ice makers, from all indications from market data that is published on the ARI, HRI website as well as Energy Star, this is about 12 to 15 percent improvement that's needed. Same thing for condensing coils and, and, and the design options needed for that, uh, broken up into batch and continuous. Um, frozen carbonated beverage machines are not affected by this ruling. So again, this is one of those exceptions like we saw for buffet tables and prep tables for the self-contained. Uh, FCB machines and slushy machines and those likes fall outside of this. This is pure ice making heads. So here are some design options for the commercial uh, automated um, ice makers. Uh, improved EER, part load operations. This is kind of like the, the ultra tech scroll with a two stage. Um, increased surface area enhanced fin surfaces and, and uh, so on and so forth. That's affecting the condenser. And then you have, and for, 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 uh, for the commercial refrigeration equipment as well as this, EC motors is a key um, for this to get there for not only condensers but also evaporators. Same with uh, improved fan blades for condensers and evaporators. More airflow to, to get that. Um, and then thicker insulation than the likes for, for that. So this is just a high-level survey of all these regulations that are impacting that we are working um, with you guys, the equipment manufacturers, as well as making sure the contractors, those that raise their hands, and design consultants and manufacturing reps understand the, the um, I guess, the, not the severity, man, that's just too severe of a word, but what's, what's going to happen? 
um, in those next couple of years and how that's going to shift um, equipment profiles to the end users. All right, so uh, no, no shortage of uh, changes and, and challenges on, on the horizon for us. So one of the things I, I wanted to talk about a little bit today that I, I think will be uh, helpful for some of you in the room, this will, uh, some of this will be review, but um, this whole notion of total cost of ownership is, is something that we're promoting pretty big at Heatcraft, and, and we think that uh, um, it is certainly relevant for a lot of the food service end users in the market to, uh, to embrace and to uh, start to put into, into application within their organizations. And as we've engaged and talked with folks about it, it's, it's actually been uh, very well received. So I wanted to share uh, what the concept is and talk a little bit about some of the technologies that uh, are you know, available today, uh, have been for, uh, for a number of years, are certainly gonna be helpful in helping us get to uh, our regulatory challenges that are, that are on the horizon. Uh, here in the uh, uh, coming in uh, very, very quickly um, uh, as the, uh, the, the dates are, are rapidly approaching. So just, you know, again, it's, it's not a complicated concept and, and I'll just kind of walk you through the, the, the four steps here of what we call the, the food service equipment asset life cycle. So the first phase is, you know, the, the planning, new store builds, uh, remodels, or in some cases energy uh, type upgrades that, that customers are implementing within their, uh, within their enterprise. Uh, the second phase where it typically gets the most attention from folks is in the acquisition, the order delivery, staging, uh, installation, and, and startup or commissioning of the equipment is uh, probably where, where a lot of folks uh, typically spend, spend their time. And, uh, and then the third step on the operating, maintaining systems, that typically is done probably by another you know, part of a food service organization. Uh, that, that spends the majority of their time making sure that the, you know, getting the, the, the maximum life out of the equipment and, and operating as efficiently as, as possible. And sometimes that, you know, that could be two separate functions within the organization and, and um, may or may not be working together you know, during the acquisition phase uh, as, as part of that, that equation and, and uh, in some cases maybe making some suboptimal uh, decisions. And then finally, the, the, the last phase we call the refresh phase. You know, what, what do you do with your old equipment? Um, you know, we've been talking a lot with folks about, you know, do you know what happens to your equipment, you know, at the end of its useful life? A lot of folks can't answer that question, um, but, it, but it's an interesting one, and, and so we've, we've been looking at some, some interesting and creative things that we can do to help facilitate the responsible recycling, you know, of, of that material and, and making sure that it's dealt with uh, appropriately. So now, you know, just to, to kind of shift gears, I'll talk a little bit about some of those technologies that are out there and available today. You saw in the previous uh, session, this whole notion of intelligent defrost. Again, this is, this is not something new. Um, and you know, still being relatively new to this industry, I've been, been with Heatcraft a little over two years, it's a little bit of a head scratcher as to why some of these technologies aren't more widely used today, uh, qu quite honestly. And being an outsider and coming into this business, um, it, it's a little bit baffling, but you know, it, it, it is what it is. But the good news is there's a lot of opportunity out there for folks to, to again, to optimize that total cost of ownership uh, equation and, and optimize all the four steps on, on the wheel. So in this case, at, at the beginning of the chart, you see that uh, you know, you've got the majority of systems that are out there today are running time defrost, whether they need it uh, or not. And again, you're, you're switching over uh, where, where the line is, is uh, where it says SDK um, activated, where now you've, you've employed an intelligent defrost type algorithm and you're seeing a, a pretty, pretty substantial reduction, in this case 40%. It's not uncommon for some people to report 60, maybe 80% reduction in the amount of defrost that, that they're currently experiencing. And again, this is all energy saved by not having to energize the heaters on the evaporator. Um, and, and so there, there's that monetary part of the equation. But the other interesting thing is you're not subjecting all of your product in your walk-in to those temperature fluctuations of going through defrost and then back and forth so there should be ultimately a, uh, a savings in reduction in food spoilage. So one of the other you know, key technologies that, that's out there, um, you know, you'll see a lot of scroll equipment in, um, in refrigeration today, but for the most part, uh, re Recep seems to be uh, the, the, the choice for many out there. And, uh, but you know, clearly, you know, there's an energy savings component uh, to utilizing scroll compressors on the medium temp uh, side of the equation, about a six to fourteen percent energy savings there, and then on the low temp, a um, little bit higher, ten to fifteen percent uh, savings. So again, a, a lot of good technology that's already out there that uh, we're certainly working 
with our, our partners at Emerson to, uh, to more actively promote and to make that, those options more attractive, try to get people to trade up and, and um, uh, you know, order equipment that has this technology already embedded in it. Uh, along with the energy savings uh, equation on the scroll condensing units is also the, uh, the reliability uh, factor. Um, you know, certainly you've got fewer moving parts uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in the, the scroll compressor technology, meaning less likely for, uh, for something to, uh, uh, to, to break. Um, you also get the benefit of uh, a sound reduction as well over the recips. EC motors, uh, regulations have been out there for a while now, mandating them for, for new applications. Uh, we still sell a lot of evaporators with older motor technology in it. We'd like to sell more with EC motor technology. We think this has a really good payback story. Typically, you know, it could be as short as a year, but typically it's, it's less than two years. Um, so not, not, uh, not, nothing new here. Whenever you can employ variable speed motors, we know that as, as you slow down the speed of the motor, you exponentially save, save energy. So for instance, a 50% reduction in fan speed uh, only uses about an eighth of the power um, instead of you know, a more linear equation at roughly 50% you know, reduction in speed, 50% reduction in power, it's actually better than that. So any time that you can slow the fans down uh, is, is really a big energy saver. So in the case of uh, you know, floating head pressure uh, type control, which are, which are again commonly available uh, out in the industry, uh, can, can take advantage of this, uh, this savings. So having total system visibility uh, and control. Uh, monitoring of refrigeration equipment. The, again, this is not something that's new, but again, not something that is widely used uh, today, but it is out there, it is available. Uh, a lot of folks uh, carry smartphones now or, or know how to get on the internet or have that, that access and that ability to, to be able to look at their, their enterprise, see how their, their equipment is, is performing, maintain that visibility, and you know, in some cases, you know, catch something that may become a problem Typically, if, if a food service operation is uh, uh, noticing that they've got a problem in their box, in some cases it may, be, it may be too late. And if they can avoid having food spoil in their freezer or their cooler, that's a big savings to the organization. So, and, and monitoring in these uh, types of solutions can really help catch those kinds, kinds of issues. You know, there's a lot, of, a lot of good data there. In some cases, a good refrigeration technician can look at how the system is performing and probably pretty closely be able to troubleshoot and diagnose, hey, that system's got Got a, got a slow leak, we need to get out there and, and take care of it. And then uh, last and, and certainly not least, not all these savings you know, manifest themselves in, in energy reductions. In this, in this situation, in this case, you, know, you might have a food service operation in a very urban environment where they just don't have the real estate to expand their walk-ins. So they have to get creative and utilize you know, different technologies that are, that are out there to adapt to changing consumer needs and preferences. So um, taking an evaporator, uh, which is, you know, for the most part, the design hasn't changed a whole lot over the years, and going with something a little bit more slimmer uh, that, that will take up less space in the walk-in, or maybe even looking at the, uh, the, the use of a package-type uh, unit to, uh, again, create more space within an existing uh, walk-in cooler or, uh, or freezer. So it requires a lot of creativity, but again, these are all, you know, options and available uh, for folks to be able to take advantage of today to, to help, again, uh, optimize that, that total cost of uh, total cost of ownership.